Welcome everyone. I'm Shelly Francis. I'm founder of Creative Courage Press. Welcome to Creative Courage Live, conversations to encourage your inner author. Thanks for being here. Today we're talking with Christine Herbert, author of The Color of the Elephant, Memoir of a Mazunga. Mazungu. Okay, Christine, you're just going to have to tell me right now how to pronounce that. <laughs> it's Mazungu, and that's kind of a, a typical way, at least in Bemba language, of just um, referring to a white person. Uh, but essentially, it's an English speaker. Yeah. Okay, so one thing that I loved about your book title, Christine, is that it also has this great tagline, one impulsive decision, the best two years of her life. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't write that. My publisher did, but I felt like that pretty much summed it up, um, especially the best two years of my life. I always call um, my years in Peace Corps the hardest and best years of my life. When people ask me, oh, how was that? You know, that's my, <laughs> that's my tagline. <laughs> they were the hardest and best years of my life. And that was absolutely true. Well, I'm excited to get to talk to you today about those years of your life, um, about your creative courage as an author, but also as a human being. Um, before we get started, I'm going to give the official bio so people can hear more about you too. So Christine is a part-time writer, part-time body worker, and full-time space cadet currently living in the Pacific Northwest. A dyed-in-the-wool introvert, she occasionally surprises everyone, especially herself, by checking, chucking it all and living an adventurous life of service overseas, once as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia and later as a manager for a nonprofit organization in Nepal. When not adventuring off to distant lands, she can be found holed up in her glorified oubliette. oubliette. <laughs> You're going to have to answer to that word too. <laughs> Under a pile of lap blankets, surrounded by a multitude of storybooks and wheels of cheese. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much. So I often call my little subterranean um, apartment here my hobbit hole. Um, but as I cannot use the term hobbit hole because, you know, uh, copyright, I always say <laughs> my underground um apartment is sort of a glorified oubliette you know it's just kind of like this oh, this hole in the ground where you know you can just go and be forgotten and uh that's 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 my hobbit hole <laughs> well i think it took creative courage to put that into your author bio so i love yeah. the word choice <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not, not a, a glorious, uh, really glamorous lifestyle here. I mean, I love being in the Pacific Northwest, but anyone who lives in Seattle area knows how outrageously expensive it is. So um, yes, living in a, a studio apartment is pretty normal and yeah, not ashamed to say it. <laughs> Well, I certainly understand that. So let's start off with the topic of the book itself. How did you decide to chuck it all and go into the Peace Corps in 2004? And what gave you the courage to do that? So in 2004, um, we were just engaging in this, what we were calling a war on terror. And it was, a, it felt very uncertain. It felt like a very strange time. Um, and I think people can really relate to that, whether or not, um, you know, they live through that time or not, because I realize a lot of young people are reading my book now, <laughs> and they don't remember the events of 9-11 and um, in kind of that feeling of uncertainty uh, about our lives and our society and um, our place in the world, um, having experienced an attack on our nation. And so that kind of spurred a lot of um, I don't know, like changes in people's lives at that time. A close friend of mine had seen it happen, saw the planes crashing into the towers as she was commuting into New York City uh, for her job. And in that moment, when she saw the planes crashing and knew that we were under attack, she decided, you know what, I'm going to join the Navy. And she became a Naval flight officer. Um, and she's like, we're at war. I'm going to carry on my family tradition and go into the Navy like my father and his father before him, you know, so she made that decision for me. That's that spurned this idea of like, we need to figure out how to live more peacefully. We need to understand each other better. 
And so that made me feel like I want to go into the Peace Corps. There was always this thought that I would like to go to Africa, especially one day. Um, I would like to go into Peace Corps. And I had been kind of carrying that around. But that, you know, incident and that kind of push to say, you know what, we can we can make a better world if we really try, you know, if we really make an effort towards peace. Um, we can do this is my thought. And, and rather than um, joining the Navy or Air Force or, you know, Marines or something like that, I said, I want to join the Peace Corps. I want to join the Peace Corps. And so that's kind of what was going through my head at the time. Yeah. And how did you end up actually in Zambia? And just for some context, what was your job assignment when you got there? So my job assignment was um, Community Action for Health Project. It was a health-related assignment. Um, so I did things like working at the clinic um, and doing an antenatal uh, clinic uh, with pregnant women or um, under five clinic with uh, young children under five um, to see if they're thriving, you know, measuring them, weighing them, um, giving them um, medications. Um, uh, also some other areas like uh, we were addressing malaria, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS. Um, there were a number of, uh, of different health sectors that we were kind of addressing all at once. And as far as going to Zambia, um, I would have taken any Peace Corps assignment they gave me anywhere in the world. And you really don't get to choose, they choose for you, but you can have a preference for a certain area of the world. And I had always wanted to go to Africa ever since I was a kid. I don't exactly know why, it's just that it always fascinated me. Um, I did watch a lot of National Geographic as a kid. I just loved it. I love seeing the animals um, and just the whole landscape and, and the culture was always fascinating to me. And uh, I always felt like I would go there one day. And so when I knew I was applying for the Peace Corps, I was like, this is it. This is my moment to go to Africa. And so I just specified I would like to go to Africa. And I got an assignment in Zambia. So I was thrilled. Although the first thing I had to do was take it, take, get a, get a map out. <laughs> I'm like, great, where's Zambia? And I had to like, look on a map exactly where it was because it wasn't a country I was as familiar with as other countries in, in Africa. Yeah. Well, we talked about this earlier, but the, the color of the elephant as the name of your book, um, it won't be too much of a spoiler alert, but people do ask you, and you just mentioned all the animals that you love in Africa. Um, tell us about the, how that title came about. Yeah, so the color of the elephant refers to a line in the book where I talk about race often being the elephant in the room. And we don't want to bring it up a lot. We feel embarrassed or we don't want to say the wrong thing. Or I, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons why we might shy around um, just bringing up race and the differences in race as a topic of conversation. And uh, I wondered now that I was going to be a minority, I was going to be a white person living in Africa, were people going to kind of be the same with me and kind of dance around it? Um, but they didn't at all, as which I was surprised and kind of delighted by, um, where they just talked about race head on all the time. You know, it was not anything to be ashamed or to dance around. It was like, no, let's talk about it. Um, and they often just brought up our differences and, you know, in a way that just kind of celebrated them. Um, so I thought, well, maybe race is the elephant in the room, uh, depending on the color of the elephant. Uh, so that's from a line in the book. I love that. And one of the things I love about, um, about the book is that the humility that you went to Africa with. Um, this doesn't feel like um, a, a white savior book in any way. Um, and in fact, it just feels like, like a story of somebody who is uh, describing all of their foibles about living somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's um, an important part of the book. I, I have a lot of trouble um, either watching movies or reading books that are kind of that white savior narrative. It just, it's so off-putting to me. Um, and I, I, I like, I like the idea of just being able to share all of, like you say, my foibles and my idiosyncrasies and, and all of my failures, really. Um, I think 
I think it's entertaining <laughs> and, and, and I don't mind, I'm not embarrassed to, to show, to show people these, you know, things about me and my behavior and my life, because it's funny, you know, it's funny. If you can't laugh at yourself, who, who can you laugh at? Right. But it's a way to learn. It's a way to learn through somebody else's eyes and through somebody else's experience and kind of feel like, okay, well, she's not a perfect person and she doesn't do everything right. And still she had an amazing experience and she made a difference and, and it was so valuable for her. Maybe something, you know, could happen to me in my life, similar to this, to this, you know, maybe I could take a chance, you know, if she can do it, maybe I can do it. Um, so that's what I hope to inspire people with. Yeah. Well, um, we were going to talk about courage. So what's an example? I know your book is full of it, but what are, what is this, uh, a time when you needed courage to live in that different culture? Uh, I felt like every day, um, took courage, even when I felt like I was really, um, getting used to the lifestyle, you know, getting used to living without electricity and running water, um, getting used to, you know, checking the chimbusu every time you went out to use the bathroom to check it for bats and snakes and whatever, you know, just to clear them out, just so that you can do a simple thing, like go to the bathroom. Like every part of life was different than American life, really. And even when I felt like I've got this, I've got a handle on it, I know how to do it. It still took a amount of courage to just go out there. Um, like I said, I could work at the clinic and, and do other things. And, and some days I would, I knew they were going to go out, you know, and I would be like, I'm doing it. And I get up and I get dressed and go. And other days I'm like, you know what, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to stay home and I'm going to just do other things, you know, like it, it took courage every day to engage in all the um, activities the Peace Corps was asking of me. Uh, but they were very forgiving about that kind of thing. They know that you're so far outside of your comfort zone. You're not going to do everything perfect every day and do all the things they're asking of you. They, they, they bring it down to like little manageable chunks. Like what did you do today? Did you, did you leave the house? Did you talk to a neighbor? Did you sit down and have a meal with somebody? Then you're doing your job. You're doing, you're doing okay. You know, so they, <laughs> they help you to like check your head and, and make things more manageable. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a specific example. You're looking for a specific example, but honestly, every day took courage. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Um, well, there were so many funny things that you described in that way of needing to find courage. Um, one of them, I'm wondering if you would share this story. In learning the new language, you actually then had to take some exams um, to test your competency and yeah. you choked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind way yeah, to say it. Yes, absolutely. I totally choked. Um, my mind went totally blank and I, and I had been, you know, studying so hard and, um, it's, it, and it's one thing to, you know, be cramming language, 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 eight hours a day into your head, you know, and, and then living with a family where they're not speaking English to you and they're still speaking this other language and you're cramming it in and, uh, but then all the other aspects of your job, you're learning and you're exhausted and you're, and you're studying by, um, a kerosene lamp, <laughs> you know, that doesn't give very good light and, you know, and, and, you know, there's a frog in the bed and there's, you know, cockroaches coming down and you're like, ah, I'm just trying to study and I can't, you know, and, uh, it just, every aspect was hard. It was, you know, a hundred percent hard. So I get there and I'm studying really hard and they're trying to make it easy. They just have a spread of food, you know, all these dish dishes that you know how to ask for because you do it every day with your host family as you're eating and they teach you how to say each food. And I could come up with nothing. It was just like a blank slate, like just totally blanked out. And, um, and because of the stress, you know, I just started crying just like this copious tears. <laughs> and, and, I had so many exams that day where I had to go from hut to hut and take all these different exams. Some were like having conversations with people or, or identifying things or whatever it was about, about language and, and culture at the time that we were studying. And I couldn't, I cried for like three hours straight. Like it wouldn't stop, you know? And that was so embarrassing because nothing like that had ever happened to me before. But that really illustrated to me like how stressful it was you know, I, I was 
you know, try, making it work, doing my best, doing what I could. But when it came down to it and I was being tested, something about that test anxiety um, just really broke me, you know? Um, and and I, it, that was really embarrassing. And yet um, I think that's a very human thing. And I don't mind, you know, exposing that and sharing that with people because it can make them feel better about, you know, times when they've had a real break too. Yeah. Well, I love how um, how you also described that the, you, you thought you were going to get kicked out for, for that reason. Um, and that you um, actually said, you know, it the program lived up to your expectations of it being hard. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you know, I had such a public emotional <laughs> breakdown <laughs> at that time. It seemed like everybody else was holding it together, you know? And um, when a Peace Corps um, head came in and talked to me, I thought, oh man, this is it. They're going to flush me right out of the Peace Corps because I'm a mess. Um, what it really was is he was checking to see how I was doing because everyone else was complaining about it was too hard. You know, everyone was like, no, this is, you know, these conditions are too hard. Uh, what you're trying to teach us is too much. This is unacceptable. <laughs> you know, they're kind of like bringing it up the food chain of Peace Corps, like, no, you know, we shouldn't be able to, you know, we shouldn't have to go through this. It should be easier for us. This is too much. And where I thought, well, it's got to be me that's the problem, not Peace Corps, <laughs> you know, like not how they're training us. It was me, like I, I can't live up to it. So it was kind of refreshing and it, it, it felt like, oh, okay, other people are having a hard time too, but not everybody shows that to the outside, you know, they may be putting on a brave face. Um, so that really helped me to kind of um, feel better about myself saying, okay, other people are having a hard time. They might not be showing it and, you know, crying in the middle of their exams, but they're also really stressed out and this is hard for everyone. Yeah. Well, um, it feels like you had physical courage that you needed to muster for living there. I mean, also paying attention to snakes in the latrine, bug worm that got into your leg that you had to live with for a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the social courage of being somewhere new. Um, so from a creative courage standpoint, let's talk about writing your book. Like yeah. tell us about your journey to decide because this was 2004, so 18 years ago. So what, um, tell us about your journey of book writing and what kind of courage did you need for that? So my book writing really began when I was in the Peace Corps. I just didn't know it. Um, I found it difficult to put down my experiences to write home about. Um, so instead of writing a lot of letters, you know, um, I, I would write my journals and then I would just mail them home. And sometimes I would mail them to New Jersey or sometimes to California. And what my family would do was then share them amongst each other. And then, uh, my father started reading them out to his um, Sunday school class. And then there were other people that were like, oh, this is so interesting. Can I read it too? Can you, can you put me on the email chain? And so I started getting sort of a following when I was in Zambia, but I didn't know about it. You know, for me, it was like, I can only write this down one time <laughs> and you guys can share it, <laughs> you know, because it was hard to kind of rehash, especially hard things over and over again. So they had kept all those journals for me from my time there. And when I came back, I started going through them and people were like, no, really, we want to hear more about your experiences or, oh, you should read a, you should write a book. Um, and even the people in Zambia, and I kind of end the book that way, you know, we're saying, you're going to write a book about this one day. You're going to write a book about us. And I thought, no way. Writing is hard. It's hard for me. Um, I, I've never, you know, really studied to do this. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I have the chops, you know. Um, but little by little, as I wrote my story out, um, I developed the chops, I think, you know. And I've had um, writers or, excuse me, interviews with, say, podcasters who have been um, English teachers. I've had former English teachers come to me and be like, 
this was very well written or like, how did you learn how to write like this? And all I can say is it's practice, 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 but also it's because I'm an avid reader and I read a lot. And I think it just kind of, I don't know if you want to be a great writer, you need to be a great reader first. Um, So, yeah. So I didn't know that I could be a good writer. I just kept at it. I just kept at it. Even when I felt like no one was ever going to read it. I'm just writing this book for me. Uh, I'm just writing it out. I'm writing about the things that hurt. I'm writing about most of the things I wrote about in the book are not the things I wrote about in my journals. Oh. Um, so they were more private, you know, especially if they were kind of really kind of embarrassing <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, they involved more adult themes, you know, um, uh, since I knew my, my dad was reading them out to his Sunday school kids, I wasn't going to put things that were more kind of adult. Um, but yeah, little by little, as I wrote it and, and it became a book, then it was like, okay, what's the next step? Do I share this with the public? Do I go public with it? And that was its own, um, journey as well. That took a lot of courage because it involves so much rejection you know, it just, every writer will tell you that, like, you don't, you don't write a book and somebody sees it and you get an agent and you, you get published and it all happens lickety split. You know, it takes years of rejections. You'll have piles and piles and piles of rejections. And, um, it takes courage to keep picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and getting back out there. And the book took me about five years to write. And then it took me about 10 years to get it published. It took me twice as long, you know, just hitting the bricks and getting out there and going to conferences and and talking about it. Um, But I think if you are determined, you can make it in publishing. You just can't give up. You just have to remind yourself it, it takes a lot of rejections to get there. Yeah. I love that. It's so true. And so Gen Z is your publisher Mm -hmm. and your book came out in um, late December, early January, January. Yeah. Officially January. I think it leaked a little bit in December (laughs) when they they first uploaded it up to Amazon, you know, things were getting out the door. I was like, it's not, it's not even released yet. How are people buying this? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so officially it was January 4th, 2022. Well, it looks like you had so much fun launching your book um, that that there were interviews, podcasts, you did Goodread giveaways, Mm -hmm. there was a little free library giveaway that you did, and um, your your photos on on Instagram have been so fun to follow. So what kind of courage did you need to get for this book to get out in the public eye, and what have you learned about doing that? Gosh, so I feel like the the first initial, what we call, you know, ARCs or the, the ARCs, you know, the advanced reader copies, that was like the most nerve wracking for me because the people that really were, you know, wanting to read it early and give early feedback, uh, you know, were family and friends. And they were the ones that I wasn't really telling these stories to, um, you know, the ones that I, I don't know, their opinion meant more, I think. And, and I was a little nervous about what they might think, you know, but, you know, all in all, it was like really good feedback. So once that initial, you know, thought was over, like, okay, the people that I know very well, and I'm very connected with, uh, still want to have something to do with me. They're, they're not writing me off. Like she's crazy. Let's never talk to her again. Once that blew over and, and I realized everything was going to be fine. It, I felt more free about sharing it with the rest of the world. I was never nervous about sharing this story with strangers, you know, sharing it with people out there in the world. That's who I wrote it for. I didn't write it for my family. You know, um, I wrote it for, for strangers. Cause you can be very open with strangers. You're not, you're not worried about any repercussions of what they might think of you. Um, so I was really glad and and open to share it with, with everybody else. Well, I want to back up then because, um, I'm wondering if there were any parts of your story that you almost didn't include out of fear or embarrassment. Hmm. No, I just, 
you know, there were just, like I said, some adult situations, sexual situations, or like I talk about like this <laughs> malaria medication I'm on that gives me like these wild erotic dreams. And I thought, do I really want my family to read this? You know, um, I thought, okay, that'll be a little embarrassing, but I'll get over it. Because again, it's like a human experience. It's a very human thing. Um, so I thought, oh, they'll get over it. But I, <laughs> I was like nervous about a certain kind of age bracket, like, you know, grandmothers and so forth reading it. But it turns out like somebody in my family, um, my auntie Dorothy, who's like 97 years old, um, read it and just absolutely loved it and got some of her girlfriends of the same age bracket to read it. And some of them are like, this is my favorite book, or I've read it several times, you know? So I've got like this little fan club, uh, down in California and they're like nonagenarians. Is that, <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe, you know, I should not worry about like what a certain age bracket is going to be thinking of me, depending on what I I'm writing about, about that material. <laughs> Um, and in the introduction, you call the book more of a confessional than a voyage of self-discovery. And you say that there were some issues that you actually didn't, you know, put into the book as because it would take a different, a different lens or a different uh, length of book and different style of book really to unpack. Yeah. Um, so how did you decide on the style of the story that you would tell? I guess it's just a write what you know kind of thing. You know, I didn't really want to um, dive into these topics that are really hardcore, um, mostly because I don't know how to, you know, it, you know, there are things, especially, you know, issues of um, race and oppression, you know, I kind of talk about apartheid a little bit um, uh, about colonization, you know, Zambia was a former British colony, it's a lot of baggage there. I kind of hint about it, like, you know, you go to Luancho, which is like the nearest town to me, and uh, the designations still stand about when uh, there was a copper mine there, and there's a lot of money, and it was, it was colonized by the British. So the first class area was white. The second class area was Indian. And the third class area were Blacks, were Zambians. And it was like, what, your third class in your own country? Like, what is this? And, and it would still stay today. Um, so it was like, it was, it was kind of painful to look at this and look at this history. And um, I, I didn't feel like I, again, like I had the chops to answer that, you know, I just, it's not, it, I don't have enough skill um, to really dive into these topics. Um, and they're, they're very emotional, you know, they're very triggering. And that was not the kind of book that I was writing. It was definitely more about my experiences. Um, and I, I touch on these things that are hard, but I don't really offer solutions for them. I offer food for thought. Mm -hmm. Um, and this happened again, when I, uh, was having a conversation with a woman and she looked at me, and this is when the Swedes, I had some Swedish doctors <laughs> coming to visit and she said, they, they love you more or he loves you more. And I was like, who, who loves me more? And she said, God does. She says, um, God loves white people more. Um, look at us black people, look at how we suffer and look at how you whites live. And I know that God loves white people more because I've seen it. And she points to the, to the church where there's, it's a Catholic church and then there's a crucifix and it's a very white Jesus that's hanging there. She says, Jesus was a white man. I've seen it. And, and was like, how do you answer that? You know? And then she tells me, she says, you are my God. And I was like, what? You know, the uncomfortableness of that, you know, stays with me even now as I'm talking about it. And, um, you know, what do you say to something like that? You know? Um, so there's so many things that, that happened that, and I hope it does just offer food for thought. And I hope people will explore some of these more challenging, um, ideas that I present in the book as part of my experience. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, cause I know it wasn't all funny and it, there were a lot of hard things and not just that it was hard being there for you, but that you witnessed a lot of hard and heartbreaking things. 
Um, we have a uh, question from one of our guests who's saying, um, what were some ways you integrated or recovered from stressors you experienced during your journey? And how does it show up in writing your book or in your book or in your writing? Hmm. So a lot of my coping mechanisms, <laughs> I feel like was turning to writing, honestly. I mean, that any, any volunteer will tell, will tell you that they read more books during their service <laughs> than at any other time in their life. Um, because a lot of times you have to look towards fiction or other stories to bring you out of yourself, um, bring you out of your experience. And, um, and, and that was true. Even, you know, when you're having your own incredible adventures, you sometimes still need to break out of that. Um, and, because it's still stressful, <laughs> whether, whether your life is, is kind of unadventurous and you are, you're craving adventure or it's too adventurous and you need to, to, to duck out and, and go into a book. I always felt like that was my medicine. Um, and I always turned to that and I feel like, you know, learning how to craft stories like that from my experience has been, um, really, um, cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think, I think all those years of book reading during that time before, and since that time, uh, have helped me put voice to those, those feelings that I was having during my Peace Corps experience. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that question, Megan. And if there are other people who have some questions, please, um, enter them in the chat and we will keep, keep talking too. Um, so Christine, you claim to be an introvert, it's in your author bio, and yet it looks like you are so outgoing in all your social media posts and that you're, I know just that you're a very fun person to be around, but that doesn't mean you're an extrovert. Um, what is it like to have to switch gears and what do you have to trust in this phase of book launching um, to put yourself out there? Uh, yeah. So it's always, I always have to like gear myself up, like psych myself up for <laughs> any sort of like big social interaction, especially if it's like a big group setting, like going to writers conferences or now giving a talk on my book. Um, you know, it's, it's nerve wracking. Um, but I always find that I enjoy doing it. I enjoy interacting with other people. I think that's something people don't understand about introverts is like, yeah, we know we like people and we like to talk to people and have these interactions, but then you feel really exhausted afterwards and you just have to retreat. And for me, it's coming back to my hobbit hole here. <laughs> I might have to be really quiet and not speak to anybody the next day so that I can recharge. Um, and trying to launch a book in this time of COVID has been sort of a blessing and a curse because I have been I've had to rely on social media more than going out and doing these book signings or giving talks or, you know, and I've done a little bit of that, but um, a lot of bookstores are just starting to do this again and open up again. Yeah. Um, a lot of things are still virtual, you know? So if you do, you know, something at your library or something, you know, people are just kind of dialing in virtually still, but that's helped me to just kind of like learn how to use some of these devices and applications, you know, like Instagram and, you know, Twitter and Facebook and whatever, because I can do that in the privacy of my own home <laughs> and reach out to people. And that's been really fun, um, especially Instagram, because it's allowed me to, you know, have the opportunity to go through all my old photos and my old clothes and other things that I brought back from Zambia and share them with people and take a trip down memory lane. And that's been super fun to do. I, I've loved sharing that with, with my readers. Yeah. I love the photos that you're posting on, on um, Instagram, which is author Herbert, right? The, yes. Your, yes. Your tag. Yeah. Um, and I'm the same on Twitter, if, if anybody's on Twitter. <laughs> So we have another question um, from Elizabeth. It, she said, I'm amazed it took 10 years to get your book published. Did your book evolve a lot over those 10 years? Yeah, I'm amazed too. <laughs> I knew when I was going into it that it would take a while, but I didn't know that long. If somebody said, you know what, it'll take 10 years. I've got a crystal ball and I've seen it. It's going to take you 10 years to get this published. I might've been like, I'm out. <laughs> but when you're in it, sometimes, you know, you, you put so much time and energy into it. You're like, I'm in too deep now. I'm not giving up, you know, <laughs> and 
<laughs> and I think that that's how this unfolded for me. Um, but did it evolve very much over those 10 years? A bit. Um, and even um, about a year before, I guess, even within the last year before it got published, I did chuck a whole a chapter that never seemed to fit right. It didn't seem right. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do away with it. Who cares that, you know, how many years I've had it and thought it was going to be a part of the book and how long it took me to write it and what it's trying to say, who cares? Like get rid of it, write something new. And uh, so that penultimate chapter was a, a chapter that I wrote shortly before it getting published. So that was a, a big change for me. I never thought I'd go back and write new material. But I think what I came up with was saying what I wanted to say better than what I originally wrote. But for the most part, it did not change too much. I toned down a few things um, and, and some language, you know, things that I, you know, I didn't care how I wrote it because I didn't know if anyone would, would ever read it. But then when I knew public eyes were going to be on it, I said, oh, let me find a better way to say that or a funnier way, you know. Um, because I do want people to enjoy it and be entertained by it. I often call it a, a Bridget Jones goes to Africa story, you know. <laughs> and even though some tragic things happen, um, I think it's mostly funny. I want people to laugh out loud, you know, yeah. e even laugh out loud at me. That's okay. <laughs> Well, I remember us talking about um, the fact that you wrote your book in present tense mm -hmm. and that you had a little pushback around that. So what was your creative decision? Because that in itself took courage. And why did you choose that approach? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what made me start writing it that way. But it felt to me um, important because it felt so immediate you know, and it felt that you were with me in the moment as I'm trying to figure things out. I didn't want to look at things, you know, in past tense, write it in past tense, because then you got to like provide explanations of like, oh, I thought this, but actually blah, 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 you know, and then you kind of like, you know, giving that hindsight, you know, um, and I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted you to be figuring it out with me you know, you're in the trenches with me, you know, figuring out everything's coming at you and you're like, what is happening? And, and that you, I wanted you to discover with me as, as the book went along. And I hadn't read too many books that had been written in that way in, in a present tense um, kind of voice, but that's what spoke to me, you know, when I started, when I started writing it and when, um, I was about, I don't know, a couple chapters in and, and you know, it was a thing I was doing. <laughs> it was official. I was writing a book. I remember Eat, Pray, Love became very popular. And I, I read that and I was so pleased to crack it open and see, oh, somebody else did that too. This is a thing that can be done. Okay. And this is popular. And I was like, all right, I'm not uh, just, you know, way out there with, with my decision. Um and so that gave me courage to continue to write in that voice. And my publisher wanted me to go back and they said, no, you know, memoirs are generally written in past tense, you know, for obvious reasons. And so they came back and had rewritten a bunch of my first chapters in, in a past tense voice to give me a sample of what it would read like. And I was like, no way. <laughs> and I was like, I reject all these changes. Sorry. I'm going back and I'm sticking to my guns. Um, because I feel like the reasons I wanted to write that about the immediacy and, mm -hmm. um, and kind of the mystery of what's going on was lost, uh, writing it in a past tense voice. Yeah. Oh, and I love that you named that. That it was almost like there were exemplars for you of, um, eat, pray, love, mm -hmm. um, or even the Bridget Joneses, you know, that gives you the courage to do something that seems out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not being afraid to, to take chances and, and be wrong and then expose that <laughs> and share that with people and have them have a good laugh at your expense. That's fine. I think those are fun. I think those kinds of stories are fun. You know, when you're surprised at somebody's choices and you see, you know, that they were not good choices. <laughs> um, I think that that's entertaining. Yeah. Well, is there anything during the book launch phase that you would say has been one of um, like 
a surprisingly fun way of getting news out about your book? You know what? I love uh, my street team. So this was one of the things that I learned about um, marketing when I would spend those 10 years trying to get published. I would go to these book conferences and I'd learn about these types of things. Um, I was learning how to publish a book and market a book uh, while I was waiting to be published. <laughs> and they said, it's so important to, to get a street team together. And that means just like your friends, family, people that like your book, people that reach out to you. It's how, how can I help? I love this. And you have a little private group and then you just kind of let them know when you've got things going on and they could share it with other people, you know, if there's, you know, a, an author talk, they can encourage people that live there to do it. Or if you have some sort of giveaway, like the little free library giveaway, I said, okay, who's got little free libraries? Who wants to donate? You know, and everybody went out and did that and sent me pictures. And, and it's fun to just kind of share that with other people and, you know, have a, a team of people that are not professional marketers. They're just, you know, your friends and family, just people that, you know, or have been introduced to, you know, through other people. Um, and I think that carries weight with the people they know, you know, if you see stuff being marketed and it's like, you know, through an agency or whatever, you know, okay, they're professional marketers. Yeah. They're getting it out there. But when it's your friends and family that are posting about it and they're holding up a book and, um, you know, you see that on Facebook or Twitter or wherever that you're connecting with your friends and family and be like, oh, so-and-so is reading this book. I wonder what that's about. Yeah. I think it holds weight, you know. It doesn't, it seems like, I mean, it's more than just a marketing strategy. I mean, it's something I've learned about courage is that it takes community and yeah. so, and authenticity. And so you've created this community of people who are excited to celebrate with you. Yeah. And it's been really fun. And I, I, you know, started with some people that I knew or just put it out there who would like to be on a street team. But the more I've been doing in-person events, the more people have wanted to come on my street team, you know, that I didn't even know before I met them, you know, in a, at a talk, you know, like when I went home to New Jersey and people were like, no, I want to be part of this. You know, I love this book. I want to get the word out there. How do, how do I get involved? You know? Uh, so that's been really fun. Yeah. Well, I'm on your street team. And one of the fun things that you did um, just yesterday was give an update and you told a story about something that happened for the person who won your, your free drawing for being involved. Yeah. Was, I just <laughs> love that. Um, so tell us that story. So um, I was doing this um, free, you know, book drop giveaway for little free libraries. Um, May 17th, I think was the anniversary of the establishment of the nonprofit that is little free libraries. And a lot of people have these in their neighborhoods that are know what I'm talking about. It's like a big mailbox kind of thing. Um, but it's just free books for your community. So you can give and take and just share. And, um, and I love that. That's a very kind of Peace Corps <laughs> thing to do, you know, <laughs> where you're just community sharing all the time. So I just really loved it. And one of the gals said, yes, I have one. And she went out to donate it. And some kids had like vandalized the little free library and broke it apart. And she's, so she took it home and she repaired it and brought it back. And then the very next day had a picture of herself donating the book, but she was like determined to, you know, get on that, um, the little slideshow I have of donations happening around the U S and she's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to get you that picture tomorrow. <laughs> I got, I got a I got to repair my little free library. Um, but that was just so sweet. Yeah. She kind of went above and beyond for that one. <laughs> yeah. And I just love the ripple effects of that. I mean, yeah. you're, you're teaching people about the little free library in the midst of that, but just somebody else had the heart to go out and do something that awesome. It just, I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. It's been so fun to see all those little free libraries and all the different styles and it's just so fun. Um, and some, places have actually taken that a step further. Um, during COVID, one of my little free libraries in my neighborhood, I think there were three, um, and I discovered them all while I was walking around the neighborhood during COVID lockdown, as we all did. One of them has turned into a half little free pantry and little free library. And that happened to, I've heard a number of places where they just wanted to share food 
you know, share other resources other than books with their community uh, for people that might need it. Um, just making that available to them. And I also found in my neighborhood, a little free art gallery. And this is as cute as it sounds, because it's about the same size, like a big old mailbox kind of thing. And it's, some of them are made by professional artists and some of them art is made by kids. <laughs> so cute. And then they could leave art or take art home. And it's just like a free resource for art, you know? So I love how this idea is kind of catching on in communities and people are just sharing resources. I love that. Um, we got another question. Uh, do you believe in writer's block and what helps get your creative juices flowing? Yeah, I absolutely believe in writer's block. <laughs> I am almost the, the poster child for writer's block. Um, I could go for a long time without having ideas or not being able to write. And the key to unlocking the writer's block is just to not give up, just, just to keep a habit of doing it, of showing up. It just keeps showing up. Um, for me, the way I would keep showing up is either, you know, taking my computer to a coffee shop or to the library after work or whatever, and just knowing I'm, I'm not going to get up out of the seat for a half an hour. If nothing happens, if nothing flows, I can give up in a half an hour. That's fine. But I showed up. I showed up to my job, <laughs> which is my hobby or has been my hobby. I showed up. Um, sometimes that's all you can do, but you just keep doing it. Uh, or for a while I was doing like 5 a.m. Writers Club, you know, so I would get up at five and I'd sit there and see what would come out and then get ready for my job and then and then go to my actual paying, paying job. Uh, but you have to make a date. And you have to keep it. Um, I think that that helps. Eventually, the creative juices will get flowing again. You just have to not give up. Yeah. Can you say more about the 5 a.m. Writers Club. Is that something like an actual online community, or that you're are you writing with somebody at the same time, or is it just like 5 a.m. everywhere people are writing? The, the, all of the above. So there is like official 5 a.m. Writers Club where you can, you could probably zoom in and, you know, you can dial in and people are there or you just check in with each other. I found it through Twitter, you know, because I've noticed I'm in a writer's community and a lot of people are like, 5 a.m. Writers Club, I'm here. Or I'm running late or whatever, you know, but something you just check in with people be like, it's 5 a.m. I'm online, I'm doing it. And you just kind of like, you know, hashtag it. Um, so I was always unofficial, but there are definitely official people that, that do this and, and they're accountable, but that helps you feel like you're not doing it alone, that other people are doing the same thing at the same time. It encourages you to get up and check in and be like, yep, I'm here. I'm here. I did it. Um, and I think that that really helps just knowing that other people are doing this too. And they're just trying to squeeze it in any way they can because people's lives are busy. And it's hard to find this time for creative expression. And sometimes you really do have to shoehorn it in there say, I'm going to set my alarm an hour or two earlier than I normally would and get that creative time in um, so that I can feel more complete as a person, you know, because if you don't take time to have those creative endeavors, you really burn out. Yeah. Yeah, creativity is definitely an antidote to the burnout and burnout is such a big thing that's happened since COVID, but I think it was boiling before that as well. Um, what would you say to somebody who's thinking about the Peace Corps today in this post-COVID time, these post-COVID times, what's happening in Peace Corps world? So um, we've had some big news in the world of Peace Corps about a month ago, I believe, um, groups are going back out. Um, everyone, when it all happened mid-March 2020, everyone was recalled around the world. Everyone had to stop their service and go home. And there was a, a moment there, it, the administration at the time kind of said, you know what, this is a good idea. This is a good time to just get rid of Peace Corps. <laughs> why, why do we still need this Peace Corps? Let's get rid of it. <sighs> And fortunately, that did not happen. There were a lot of advocates for Peace Corps, um, and it has remained. Um, and I think for a little while, there were doing um, some remote type um, teaching assignments. Um, and then people were going back um, to administer vaccines. 
for COVID. And now things are opening up and Zambia is one of the first countries uh, that people are going back to. So people came back to Zambia um, to go into their, whatever their assignment was before healthcare, fish farming, or, you know, teaching or any of the other um, endeavors. There are a few different endeavors I should mention for Peace Corps. So the big ones, and they've kind of been there since the beginning are agriculture, uh, environment, education, youth development, uh, community economic development, and health. And that's the, the assignment that I had, but those are kind of the basic uh, things that are being addressed by Peace Corps. Yeah. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour, so I want to just start to wrap things up. Um, if there's any other questions, please pop them in the chat. But uh, Christine, what's calling to you next and what kind of courage will you need next? Oh, gosh. So um, this has been so huge, this um, book launch, and, and it, it continues to, you know, press on me. Like, how do I continue to, to get the word out about the book? Because it's not just about the book. It's about talking about Peace Corps and this book is what we call like a third goal kind of assignment, um, which is um, promoting a better understanding of other peoples on the part of Americans. And this part of your Peace Corps assignment kind of lasts your the rest of your life. And so this is a way for me to do that, to really share with a larger audience what I learned about Zambia, about Zambian culture, about the people of Zambia. Um, so I'm continuing to try to find the courage to be like, okay, how, what is my next, you know, speaking engagement? What's another way that I can get the book out there or talk to people about it? So I'm doing more of that, uh, marketing and just kind of giving talks, book signings and so forth. Um, and then I'm continuing to write about Africa. Um, I've been writing a novel for a long time, so it's not a, a memoir. It is a work of fiction, but again, it's uh, taking place in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, you know, a place that I lived and love to write about and continue to go back in my memory. Um, so that has been kind of where all my creative juices have been flowing recently, just kind of going into that, uh, work of fiction. So that would be the next big thing on the horizon for me. Oh, that's exciting. Well, um, I loved the color of the elephant. It, I really did feel like it's the kind of book you stay up past midnight to finish because that's what I did. And I loved laughing out loud at it. Um, if you have read Christine's book, please do leave a re review for it um, whether, wherever you bought it. Um, it really does make a difference to other readers deciding whether to read it too. And it makes a book have more visibility. We've learned to have more reviews. Um, and um, Christine, is there anything else you want to leave as a final thought for aspiring authors or aspiring Peace Corps adventurers? Oh, gosh. Um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about um, the Peace Corps. You know, we talk about the Peace Corps, but what is the Peace Corps? So I'll just give you a little, a very brief um, understanding of what that is. The Peace Corps is an independent agency and volunteer organization run by the United States government, um, providing international social economic development assistance. Um, in essence, it is a peacekeeping mission. And uh, I think it's a really unusual, uh, difficult, and wonderful endeavor. You know, if there's one like hard thing that you want to try in your life, try Peace Corps. Hmm. <laughs> it's just an incredible experience, uh, whether or not you finish your whole term of service, which is two years, three months, or you do it for a certain amount of time and come back. Um, I think you'll find that it's life-changing and I hope you will, um, you know, have the courage to try it. And it's open to people of all ages. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, I'd say all, all ages, adult ages. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's no kind of age limit just as long as you are um, healthy and fit uh, for your service. Um, 
but you know, if you have disabilities, that doesn't necessarily um, disqualify you. You know, there are other um, assignments that could accommodate things. Like where I lived, it, it was very rural and living in a mud hut and so forth. So if I was in a wheelchair, that might not have been the best assignment for me. But maybe there's a place in you know Eastern Europe that you know maybe maybe in Romania that would have worked for me. You know what I mean? Like so, like there's there's other assignments that can work for you, and. Uh, even one of the very first uh, groups that went to Zambia, the very first group, um, there was a volunteer there who was deaf. And, and he wrote a fascinating memoir called The Unheard. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. You know, well, how, how inspirational is that? You know, um, so yeah, don't, don't count yourself out thinking, oh, this can't be for me. You know, I'm too old or, you know, whatever your reason is. Um, absolutely. Look into it if you have an interest. That's a really interesting um, invitation to think about. Um, and so I guess the final thought for our audience, whether you're here and thank you for being here, that you, those of you who are here, um, is when is the time that you needed courage to go somewhere new and what gave you the courage to go for it or what would give you the courage to go do something new like that? So thank you, Christine, for being here. Thank you so much. Thank and you forward to future conversations. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you.